thank you. Um, so I'm Paul O'Grady. I'm going to talk about PyTorch and Autograd. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, currently, I'm a data scientist at Zalando in Dublin. Uh, so Zalando are an online fashion retailer. Um, I'm also a member of the PyCon Ireland organizing committee. Um, we'll have our conference in October this year if you're interested in come to Dublin. Um, and I'm also on Twitter, so if you'd like to follow me. So just a quick overview of what I'll talk about today. Um, so I'll just give a, back, a quick background on matrix computations and deep learning, that sort of stuff. And then I'll get into PyTorch, tensors and variables. And I'll talk about Autograd. So Autograd is actually a module within PyTorch. Um, and I'll discuss gradients and backpropagation, that stuff. Um, I'll then give a simple hello world example of the, how to use the, the framework, just simple linear regression. Um, and then I will illustrate differences between a defined by run uh, framework, which is what PyTorch is, and a define and run framework. Um, and I'll do that at the end. Okay, so just a quick background. Um, so before deep learning and uh, GPUs and frameworks around GPUs, um, obviously all computation was based constrained to CPUs. And the sorts of tools you would have been using um, would have been stuff like, well, we'd still use stuff like BLAS, which basically give you um, simple matrix computation routines and uh, LAPAC, which would uh, give you routines for solving linear systems, stuff like that. And then in, and in, and then in Python, um, you'd be using NumPy, you're probably familiar with NumPy. Um, so all, this, all these tools are all based around uh, performing uh, computations on the CPU. Um, and yeah, so it all support, well, NumPy supports, say, multi-dimensional uh, multi arrays and the arrays. Um, but at that time, there wasn't great support for like tensor operations, stuff like that. Um, so with deep learning, probably you've heard of that, um, basically the models here are quite large and you need a different paradigm for com uh, computing um, the models and updating the gradients, all that stuff. Um, so people started using GPUs that allowed, deep, um, that basically enabled deep learning. Um, and so basically here we use tensors and there are a number of frameworks, they probably know TensorFlow, um, Tiano as well as PyTorch we'll talk about now. Um, but yeah, so we're, we do the computation on GPU because it's an awful lot uh, faster, an order of magnitude faster. And um, so as I said, there are a number of different frameworks, uh, TensorFlow, Tiano. Um, and another thing that the frameworks offer is, in addition to like doing your computation on the GPU, uh, it would have uh, support or features for um, calculating uh, gradients, um, either symbolic or automatic difference, differentiation. And that's important for machine learning algorithms because you usually have to calculate a gradient to feed into an optimization algorithm. Um, and before these tools, you'd do that by hand. So you'd pen and paper, calculate what the gradients are for your update rule. Um, and now there are tools that will do that for you just from the cost function. Okay, so the great thing about all this stuff is that Python's at the center of this. Um, all those frameworks I mentioned uh, have uh, bindings for Python. And I suppose the new kid in the block is now PyTorch. Um, and that's what I'll talk about. So PyTorch. So I suppose the first thing to mention about PyTorch is um, Torch itself has been around a long time. It's uh, a Lua framework. Um, so there's a lot of great work within that community to, um, that has been done to build um, Lua, uh, build Torch. Um, obviously, PyTorch has bindings around us, and they still share a common C library, stuff like that. And uh, Lua Torch is still its own separate uh, project as well. So PyTorch is quite a new framework. I think beta release was in uh, January. And I suppose the key difference between PyTorch and other frameworks is um, that's a defined by uh, run framework, um, as opposed to define and run. And we'll discuss that later on. But to me, um, and one of the reasons, well, the reason I like PyTorch is it looks more like programming, as you know, um, but feels to me to be more Pythonic. Um, so I feel with other frameworks, uh, you kind of feel that there's a bit of setup going on before you actually get to do your training. Um, which is fine, it, um, but I think with PyTorch it just uh, feels a little bit nicer. So the main components here, um, PyTorch are the NN module, and that allows you to build and train neural networks, and um, that's what deep learning is. Um, so these neural networks can become very complicated with many different layers, uh, many different types of uh, modules and layers. 
um, and PyTorch is basically used at the cutting edge of like research, so it, it supports all that stuff. Um, another thing about PyTorch is it has Autograd, which uh, has a nice um, support for automatic differentiation. I'll talk a bit about that. And then once you have your graduate, uh, sorry, your uh, gradients from your from your AD, you can then use that to update your your uh, model parameters for your deep learning network or whatever, or linear regression using the optimization routines in, in the framework. So I'm going to give a few examples here, um, some code examples. So the version of PyTorch that this, uh, these examples are for is uh, 0 0.1.12, um, and it's running on uh, Python uh, 3.5. So just to give you a kind of a, a quick overview of the status of the project. Um, so this is uh, a tweet that I've seen recently on Twitter. Um, it basically uh, shows the aggregate activity on GitHub uh, repos for different uh, deep learning um, libraries. Um, PyTorch is a uh, fifth, uh, fifth there, which is quite good. It's, it's a, quite a young project. It's probably obvious at the top there, TensorFlow, you have Google and big companies behind that one, but still, even after a few months, um, it's doing very, very well at uh, fifth spot there. So, um, first talk about tensors, and I have a simple example here. Um, so just to be clear, um, so we're talking about matrix multiplication, stuff like that. Um, you would not use native uh, Python lists to do matrix multiplications, I'll just state that. Um, you can model a matrix using a list of lists, but you would not uh, implement it that way because, well, you can do, um, but it's very inefficient. Um, so lists, as you know, can uh, uh, contain arbitrary items, arbitrary types. Um, so there's a lot of overhead on the kind of memory handling of that um, that you would want to avoid when you're doing big computational jobs. So everyone, you're always going to use a different uh, framework or, or module, so you might use NumPy. Um, so the way TensorFlow handles that, sorry, uh, PyTorch handles that is, we use uh, tensors. Um, so these tensors can be initialized, as you can see here, with like lists. Um, but the underlying kind of memory, uh, the way they're mapped, uh, mirrors more, say, a C programming array, where the um, individual items are contiguously laid out. But it's just, yeah, that's the foundation, is these, um, uh, these types of data structures. Um, so if you're used to looking at NumPy, um, once you have your, uh, your, your tensor or your ND array, you can perform many different types of uh, sorry, operations and extract many different types of information. So you can determine, say, the size of the tensor. Um, obviously, you can add. You can add in place and out of place. So here's just a exam simple example where I set up uh, a tensor of ones, um, add, them, uh, add two uh, tensors of ones, then I do it uh, in in place add. So PyTorch supports in-place um, operations, and they are uh, identified by uh, um, an underscore at the end of the method name. Um, so yeah. So, yeah, so I mentioned NumPy. Um, so you, you may be in a situation where you have your data already prepared or transformed or whatever uh, using NumPy. Um, and you want to get that into uh, these uh, um, PyTorch tensors. Um, and the simple way of doing that, is this, so it supports like a NumPy bridge. Um, so here I have um, a y underscore np um, NumPy array, which I've defined. Um, and I can multiply it um, by the previous uh, um, float uh, tensor that I created by just specifying this NumPy method on the um, tensor. And the simple as that. You look at the result, and it's uh, basically a NumPy array. So that's handy. So it's very easy to um, include NumPy uh, using PyTorch. You can also go the other way around. So we have um, we want to uh, multiply uh, matrix multiply um, two tensors, and we set up a Z, which is a, a NumPy array, um, and then using Torch from NumPy, you can create uh, a, a, a tensor. And then you know you get the result. So three, uh, two by three by multiplied by three by two gives you a two by two matrix. And because we're on shorts, it, it basically you get a torch uh, dot short tensor. So that's all handy stuff. That's all, all, all good stuff that you'd expect from a framework. Yeah, other operations you can do is uh, you can create, uh, you can change the shapes of um, your tensors, and that would be expected. Um, another nice thing about PyTorch is y you can be very explicit about where the computation um, happens. Um, so obviously you mentioned the GPU and that's where you're doing most of your, your computation. But you can explicitly um, say that. Uh, so you can set up your variable, sorry, your tensor 
and then you can specify that should be um, on the GPU. Um, likewise, you can say, I would like to move that to the CPU. So it's very explicit, and um, you know where things are being um, moved to. Um, you have to be careful with your copies and stuff like that, but it's just nice to be explicit like that, uh, and that's a nice feature. So another important component of um, PyTorch is uh, variables. So variables are, are imported from the Autograd package. And basically, a variable um, is a tin wrapper around the tensors. Um, so what the, uh, the variable gives you is it allows you to specify a computation graph. Um, and when it comes to the back propagation and the machine learning and updating your uh, param uh, model parameters and that sort of stuff, it allows you to do all that as well, so accumulation of gradients. Um, so for uh, machine learning and deep learning, it's important um, to know the history of how a value has been calculated. Um, so that suggests like a DAG, a directed acyclic graph, or some sort of computation graph. And that's basically what the variable does. So the variable will keep a history of how that value has been um, uh, calculated, um, and basically gives you the structure of uh, the, the graph that um, was used to create that. So that's useful when it comes to um, the AD stuff. Um, and it's also, uh, so th that's a, a, a nice feature. Yeah, so as I said, that will allow you to uh, facilitate the back propagation um, of gradients and uh, basically supports the AD stuff. So yeah, I just, I just want to mention that. So all the, the slides I'll be talking about here, um, they're all uh, in the context of machine learning of the learning step. Um, once you have your model learned, you don't need any of this back propagation gradient stuff. So um, you can still use the variables, but um, the way to uh, specify that you don't need a gradient stuff and you just want to run in inference time or test time is to uh, set the volatile flag on your variable. So you do, so, you do that if you're in production with the model. So here's um, just a, a simple example of a variable. Um, so it's important from Autograd. Um, you can see that it's initialized with a tensor. Um, it's just got two simple uh, tensors here, X and Y. Um, I then add them together to get Z. And then I just um, echo out the, the um, values that are in Z after the addition. So as I said, variables keep history. So there's an additional property on the variable, the Z variable, because it's an autograd variable. And that's called creator, which is this one here. And that basically tells you the last operation that was performed to actually uh, calculate the result. Um, and in this case, it just shows you it's an addition. Um, then I can take Z and do, uh, say, uh, uh, some operation on the contents of that um, tensor and assign that to S. I can do the same, have a look at the creator for S, and you can see that um, it identifies that the last operation was a sum. Okay? So this is using this creator, dot, um, sorry, creator property. So that's an interesting thing. So with the creator, it, it, it gives you a reference um, to, uh, for a data structure where you can actually chase the references and, and construct a graph for yourself. Um, so I have a simple um, recursive uh, function here that basically uh, prints out um, the different operations and the data when it hits the data. Um, and by passing the s.creator, um, you can see the different operations that have been applied to s. Um, so S, S here, I'm doing a, an addition assign, um, and you can see that the first operation is add constant, then the sum, then the add, and then it, it, it shows the, um, you actually display the data that was there. Um, so that's, that's a nice feature. So you can imagine for big um, deep learning networks, um, you, you, could echo, you could create a graph like this, more fancy graph, saying with, with say, a dot um, type, with the dot library. But um, it also keeps a version. So each time the variable s is mutexed, uh, mutated, um, it basically increments this version number, and that's used in the machinery of the autograd. So that's a nice feature as well. OK, so I'll just talk quickly about autograd. Yeah, so autograd um, provides classes and functions that implement uh, automatic differentiation of arbitrary scalar valued functions. So scalar valued functions, so you're usually talking about cost functions, loss functions, um, stuff like that, and they're usually scalar valued. So that's why um, it's highlighted there. Um, and just a quick note that the type of AD that's uh, implemented with Autograd is a reverse mode um, auto dif differentiation. Okay, so this Autograd um, module 
is actually, so it's obviously it's coming through Lewatorch, but that was actually originally inspired by another Python mod, uh, uh, project called Autograd. So it's gone from Python into Lua and now full circle back into um, Python um, uh, through PyTorch. Um, so the define, uh, define uh, by run um, paradigm is inspired by the Chainer um, uh, framework. Uh, also in the manual, um, uh, the docs for PyTorch uh, mentioned that the implementation for, for uh, Autograd is pretty quick, which is great. Yeah, and so um, to implement uh, the backpropagation, um, the only change you have to add is, is just basically um, change your tensors to variables, and that's a very, very simple thing to do. Okay, so we're going to talk about backpropagation, we're going to talk about Autograd, automatic differentiation, all that stuff. I'll just quickly discuss um, calculus or differential calculus and just uh, to kind of illustrate why we need to do this. So differential calculus, okay, so you may or not, may not remember from school or college, um, so basically you have a function. Um, so this uh, equation here is, is to calculate a derivative from first principles. But basically, you have a function and you have a point x, and you would like to know, um, you would like to uh, know the gradient of a tangent at that point, okay? So that's where the gradients come into it. So to do that, you take your original function, um, you perform differential calculus, and you get a derivative. And then using um, the initial x input, um, using the new derivative, which is also a function, you just basically apply that into the function, and whatever value that comes out of that basically tells you what the gradient is, or basically the slope of this line. So we're really talking about points on a curved function and uh, calculating a gradient for that, basically a slope uh, of a line. And then we use this, these slopes or gradients to indicate something uh, of value to us. And in terms of um, machine learning and optimization, this allows us to identify extreme of functions, so basically uh, maximum points and minimum points. And the way we do that is by looking at the gradients for the functions. And that's why we use differential calculus. So backpropagation, um, yeah, so backpropagation, because we're uh, talking about uh, networks and multi-layer networks, it's difficult to um, calculate uh, derivatives of those type of networks. Um, so there's an algorithm that will do, uh, do that. Uh, it's a famous one you probably know about. It's uh, backpropagation. Um, so that will uh, calculate the gradients of your model parameters with respect to the loss function. Um, and then we'll push back the gradients um, through the network and uh, allow you to update or change the model parameters to make get a, a better uh, solution. So the, uh, the, the, um, the rule that we use to actually achieve this is uh, the chain rule. It's a standard rule in uh, differentiation. Um, and backpropagation basically iteratively applies that to all the different layers. Um, and that's how it pushes the gradients back through the network and how they can be then used to update the parameters. So Autograd does this for us, it does the backpropagation. So when we're talking about Autograd, we're talking about backpropagation. Uh, and it's simple, uh, simply implemented using uh, just a backward method on our variables. So the stuff that we've been doing with the variables, um, that's setting us up now for um, calculating derivatives and doing backprop. So just as a simple example or kind of, um, just to convince yourself that differentiation is actually happening when you run a, a backprop. I just have a very, very simple example here. Um, so the derivative of a sine function is a cos function. Um, and I'll just illustrate or try and convince myself that um, backpropagation will actually give me uh, what I expect, which is cos. OK, so I just set up a simple um, x variable, which is basically one period of a sine wave, so from 0 to 2, uh, two pi. And then I calculate the sine of that um, signal or variable um, using just torch.sin um, function. Um, and then the output obviously goes into out. So another feature of the, um, uh, of, of the variables is uh, you, you have an additional grad property which, uh, which will echo out the um, actual gradients for that uh, variable if they were calculated. Um, at this point, they have not been calculated, um, so it returns nothing. But at this point, I calculate the gradients by uh, calling the backward um, method, um, and at that point it will calculate the gradients for you. So this will basically calculate d out dx. Um, so the next time you look at the grad, you will see that there are gradients there. 
Um, so first what I do is I just look at the out. I convert it to NumPy just to make it a bit easier to read. Uh, and for the, the inputs, which is 0 to uh, 2 uh, pi, I have a look what the out is. And we get 0, 1, 0, minus 1, 0. And that's basically a sign. Then by looking at the gradient or the grad property, um, I do the same. And we can see that's changed. Okay. Um, 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 1. So that's basically the cause. Um, so we've convinced ourselves now that it's performed the um, uh, calculated gradients for us. Um, and we just do another check where we compare it back to cause. So that's great. Um, uh, we've convinced ourselves that it works, and um, we're, we're happy with all that. Just another simple example. Actually, no, sorry, first. Um, so how does all this work? Um, so basically, uh, deep in the code of uh, PyTorch, you will uh, the sin um, sign function is actually uh, in this instance of this uh, sign class, uh, which basically inherits, inherits from a function which is imported from Autograd. Um, so we, you can see two methods here. We can see the, uh, the sign function um, for, uh, in the forward um, uh, method, but we can also see backward. Okay? And we look here closely, we see that it basically just on the backward method, it just calls cause, okay? which is the correct thing to do. Um, we know in advance that uh, the derivative for a sign is cause, and basically that's what we do. So if, you're, if you've you looked at calculus before, you know, know there's standard tables for different functions and derivatives. We basically do that the same thing in uh, PyTorch, um, and we instantiate them as classes. So in the backward method here, that, identify, that specifies the um, gradient formula. That gives you a gradient. And yeah, if you actually wanted to um, extend PyTorch, well then this is the pattern you'd use. You'd, you'd, you'd uh, subclass from function and you'd um, create a, a class where you'd have your forward method um, and then you'd define the gradient function backward method. So just another simple example, I just wanted um, to uh, display uh, a tangent. So we have a quadratic function here. Um, I do something similar to before. I, I create an um, x variable, which is a linear space. Um, um, note that it requires grad is equal to true is here. Um, but then I basically set up the do uh, I equation, quadr quadratic equation. And I'm only interested in looking at um, a gradient for one point within our linear space there. And I set that up. Um, and then finally, on y, I um, call the backward function um, using the gradients that I've set up here. Um, so the main thing we're interested in is interested in is um, the value of the gradient at that point that I've, I've uh, identified, which is uh, indicated by this index here. Um, so I know that the value here should be minus 4. I'm getting minus 9.3 because of the discretization. Um, and from these in this information, I can calculate the gradient. So I'm just now going to plot that um, and ju just uh, plot the original quadratic function and the, um, the, the gradient and tangent. So we can see, we, uh, this just confirms again um, what we'd expect. We have our point, a minus 1, which is a red dot, on our quadratic function. And we have a nice uh, tangent there. You can see that in the plot. So that's great. OK, so I'll just um, finish off with a simple low world example, which I mentioned. So just going to talk about linear regression. So linear regression is basically you have a, a cloud of data points, and you're going to try your best to fit a line to that, to that cloud of data points. Yeah, so you'll fill a line to the data and you'll try to minimize the distance between the line and all the points uh, close to the line. So the model for this is quite simple, uh, it's just a linear relationship. Um, so y equals uh, alpha x plus um, beta. Uh, y, uh, sorry, uh, alpha is a weighting and b is an intercept. X is uh, called independent variable and y is dependent variable. Um, so this model is actually already implemented uh, in PyTorch. You don't have to uh, implement this yourself. Um, and that's in the NN uh, module. Uh, this is the module where you'd see other uh, types of models as well, like convnets and whatever else, other stuff like that. Um, but that's our model for this. And this is what our data looks like. Um, so I've created this for, um, uh, I've created a noisy example, so I've introduced some noise there. Um, uh, alpha is 2 and beta is 3, so you can see the intercept here is around 3. Okay, so yeah, just quickly uh, um, about, uh, so we've been talking about models, um, that's great, but you need other things as well to uh, learn and to perform machine learning. You need a cost function, well, I'll discuss that, um, but you also need to identify or specify um, a learning algorithm for to update your model parameters. 
So the cost function we use is pretty standard, um, one uh, mean square error. Um, so the value for this f uh, cost function would be zero when uh, your predicted values and your, um, your actual values are exactly the same, and that's what you're, you, you want. Um, we also have to define the optimization algorithm. Um, here we use classic gradient cents, it's a very common one. Um, so this is where we use our gradients. So we, we have here um, the gradient of our cost function, which is MSE, uh, with, with respect to the model parameters. And then those gradients are used within the um, optimization algorithm or the stochastic gradient set algorithm. So there's a further step after you've calculated your gradients as needed. Okay, so I'll just show you the code. Um, so I've set up, this is how I set up my data, my X and Y. So this is basically the, uh, the cloud of points that you saw in the figure. Um, and basically we set up our linear regression model. So this is how you set up a model in um, PyTorch. Um, in the init, you will specify the different layers or, or, or modules that you need. In our case, it's just a simple example, one layer, just a linear. And then in the forward pass, you would uh, describe how these different layers are combined. Um, for us, again, it's very simple. But you can imagine for like big uh, deep learning networks, this class could get very, very big um, uh, with a lot of layers and a lot of different interactions between how the forward uh, method is specified. Then finally, we just instantiate it, um, and because we're only interested in one-dimensional uh, regression, we just specify that then in the model. So I mentioned we need a cost function. Uh, I said we'll use MSE, um, I specify that here, and then I also specify the stochastic gradient descent and the learning rate, which just uh, instantiate the optimizer. Um, and here we have our training data. This is basically the cloud of points that I showed. So um, before we do any training, you can actually inspect the model parameters, see what the values are. Um, so there's a, on the model, there's a, a method called name parameters, uh, and that's basically a, a generator of the different um, uh, parameters. So here we can see there's a weight, which is our alpha, and we can see a bias, which is our beta. So these values are randomly initialized, and then after training, they'll be changed, um, and, that's, uh, and then we'll have our line for the, for the data. So this is the main training loop um, for, for it to actually train the model. Um, so this is the way PyTorch does its training within uh, loops. Um, so the first, it does five steps here. Uh, first step is to zero the gradients on the model parameters. Um, so the gradients actually accumulate, and if you don't zero them, well then you, they'll just continue to accumulate. Second step is, step is to take your model, take your inputs, and then uh, take the output. So you're just basically uh, running the model on the input. Then from your outputs on the third step, um, you can compare them then to the labels using the criterion, and that, this will give you your loss. So this loss is a scalar. Um, so when you look at convergence plots in machine learning, this is basically why you're plotting this single value. Um, and using this loss, uh, because it's a variable, we can then uh, uh, simply apply backpropagation to that uh, by calling backward. So once you have your gradients, you can then update the model parameters using the optimizer, and you do that by calling step on the optimizer. So you can see here within the loop, there's a lot of things going on. The, stop, the, the, sorry, the steps are very explicit, um, and this is uh, a defined by run type um, uh, paradigm. So just keep that in mind. So we've finished our training. And we have another look at our model parameters, um, and we can see that there's been a change in our model parameters. Another feature of the model is that you can actually introspect on the different layers. Um, so I just pretty print uh, the individual layers of our model, which is simple linear regression. And then I plot the line. So here we can see there's a line fits pretty well to the original data, and we can say that our model has now uh, learned uh, from the data. So I mentioned that um, in the loop that I showed for PyTorch that um, it was defined by run. Um, I'm just gonna quickly compare the exact same uh, problem uh, to Tiano, which is another uh, deep learning framework. So here in Tiano, we import Tiano, we set up, the, in a similar way to the previous example, we set up our X and Y um, data. Um, it deviates in the way that it calculates gradients, so you have to set up symbolic um, variables. Um, you also set up your model, um, you use a shared uh, variable to set up your model variables, and then you define your model and uh, create an instance. So that's just a quick run through there. 
Um, similar to PyTorch, you have to set up your cost function, then you have to calculate your gradients. You can see this is done in a very different way. And um, you specify your updates, and then you have this step where you take all this stuff um, and you basically compile uh, uh, this, all, all this information into um, a Python um, function. So then the final thing to do is uh, just uh, do, perform the training, and you can see that also requires another for loop. Um, but here we can see that it's very sparse. It's, it's just basically a one-liner. Um, so that contrasts very, uh, a lot with um, uh, PyTorch. Um, uh, so there's no opportunity here to kind of make changes within your learning loop. Um, so there's no kind of dynamic um, uh, possibility to introduce dynamic behavior here. Whereas in um, PyTorch, within iterations, you could have different branches. You could make changes uh, within each um, iteration. So here, Tiano basically creates the computation graph um, before training, and uh, PyTorch does it um, at each iteration. So just to finish up, um, so I discussed PyTorch uh, and the NumPy bridge of tensors and stuff like that. Um, also discussed uh, yeah, graphs and variables, and talked about gradients on autograd, Give a simple example, and then I, at the end here, I've just uh, illustrated a different screen defined by run and defined and run. So that's me finished now. I don't know if we have any time for questions. Well, thank you very much, Paul. It was great, great talk. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we do not have time for questions. 2.30, exactly, but right on time. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, again, let's thank the speaker again.